people living with chronic kidney disease. So you can see the sort of scale of the problem. Um, in terms of um, optimizing uh, and identifying um, chronic kidney disease, uh, just to give you some uh, background, CKD, um, as many of you may be aware, is a reduction in kidney function uh, or damage, uh, and it's uh, sustained over a sort of three month period. I've just highlighted a few uh, bits on this slide to focus on uh, what you'll get a flavor of through this talk is, is, is a strong focus on, on urine, on albuminuria, um, and, and that being really a, a very common marker of, of kidney damage. Um, CKD in itself is a, is a very high risk condition for, for cardiovascular disease and is an independent risk factor for that. It's much more prevalent um, in people with um, diabetes, particularly type 2 diabetes that we see a lot of in, in primary care. Uh, and people with hypertension, that probably accounts for about two thirds of people with, with CKD. Uh, and, and there is good evidence that this sort of failure to identify uh, code and therefore treat um, CKD is linked with, with doubling mortality. So <clears throat> it's an important disease area to therefore give, give focus on and hence why we're, we're, we're talking about it today. Um, Talbuminuria really, really is a, is a, a, a common, common issue and problem um, with, with CKD. Sorry, I'm just moving through the slides. Jeez. Um, so this this links through to um, some of our aims and objectives. Um, the the aims and objectives for the LKN are around this early identification. There's a strong focus on coding, and that links through to management, which you'll hear Dr. Shaw talk about later, uh, particularly uh, SGLT2 uh, prescribing. Um, uh, as well as all the other uh, management that should be happening around sort of statins, blood pressure control and so forth. And again, just to go back to what I alluded to earlier around um, the, the issues with, with urine tests, what this slide is showing, and it's from data that's a few years old, but hasn't really changed uh, very much over the years uh, from the National CKD audit, is just how good we are at, or how much better we are, I should say, at doing blood tests versus urine tests. So what you're seeing here are that for people with diabetes, for example, um, the, the graphic at the sort of top left is how many of those people would be having blood tests done. Uh, and the graphic on the right in, in, in red uh, at, the, at the top right is showing how many of those people have urine tests done. So you can see the, the difference between getting blood tests done versus urine tests. Um, and that's that's amplified as you go through other disease um, cohorts. So for high blood pressure, many, many people, the vast majority of people get blood tests done, but but very few manage to get urine tests done and for other risk factors as well. So, so urine tests really is, is, is an area of, of focus. And I think that's that's a key um, sort of take home message from this. Um, as I said, that that data was from 2017. But if we look at more recent data, this is um, eight care process completion for people with with diabetes across all the kind of uh, integrated care systems in, in London. At the top there, um, you can see urine ACR capture, uh, which is sitting in the sort of mid uh, mid to high 50s at, at best. Uh, and if you compare that to all the other uh, uh, 8K process capture that that happens in terms of blood tests, smoking, weight, et cetera, it's, it's always a poor relation of everything. So, um, and again, this is 2021, but um, even though the, the the absolute numbers have gone up um, sort of as, as we sort of come out of COVID, the, the percentages are, are still very similar. So, so urine ACR capture really um, is, is an area of work. And that leads on to this, this flow chart, which I'll spend a few minutes just talking about. And this is what we've come up with as a consensus of, of a kidney health check. And it's just to help um, guide people and orientate them as to, as to how to um, improve um, uh, CKD identification. So a kidney health check is a, is a combination, and that's a really crucial word here. It's a combination of both a GFR or estimate GFR and uh, the urine um, albumin creatinine ratio test. So both of those are crucial components of doing a kidney health check. As a guide, people with diabetes have that done yearly. Uh, people with hypertension every couple of years, so every sort of one to five years we've, we've set as a, as a, as a barometer. Uh, and what we've done here is put um, urine ACR at the forefront. So that's the first entry point into, into this pathway. Uh, and if you look at the kind of boxes at the top, you can see the urine ACR either being less than three, three to 70 or more than 70. And that then uh, directs as to where you'd go next. So if we just sort of follow the flow chart through, if someone's urine ACR is less than three, um, that would be defined as being OK. Um, and then based on their, their blood tests, um, you'd either define them as having CKD if uh, or CKD stage um, three 
um, and beyond if their GFR was less than 60, or C getting one or two if, if the um, GFR was greater than 60. Uh, and again, just moving along the, the flow chart, if their urinary albumin creatinine ratio is greater than three uh, or between three and 70, and uh, that then um, needs to be confirmed with a follow up um, follow up test, uh, but they would be defined as having CKD uh, based on that. You'd also be checking their GFR as part of it, so you can do um, uh, really appropriate staging and coding, uh, but they're already uh, being defined now as having as having CKD. That initial uh, urinary ACR test could be done at any time. I tend to do it as a random test initially with people. Um, it's quite difficult to get. Um, you know, sort of ideally first morning test done. Um, that should be if you're if you're confirming a diagnosis, it's it's a good practice to then follow that up with with a first or early morning um, urine ACR. But the initial test could be done uh, uh, randomly at any time. Um, if the urine ACR is is higher, uh, is a higher value, usually above seventy, then you don't need to confirm that um, that value. It's it's only if they're in that sort of mid range of three to seventy. Um, and then that leads on to the box at the bottom, which is really all the sort of nuts and bolts of what happens within this um, kidney health check then. So a lot of it is then informing someone um, that they've got chronic kidney disease. What is that? Um, you know, what, what's what's sort of happening to their kidneys? What does it mean? Um, for those of you not familiar, um, there is something called the kidney failure risk equation, uh, which is um, advocated by NICE now, uh, and you can you can find it on, on, on the links or just even by just Googling it. Um, and it's a really useful way um, of, of um, putting across to someone what their risks are of, of, of kidney failure and, and subsequent kidney damage and so forth. And um, the, the, the number is usually set at uh, values above 5% of, of being sort of significant and, and warranting onward referral to um, specialist services. So that's um, something that we're used to within primary care of, of quantifying and talking about risks, whether that's with Q risk and so forth. So this kind of link, links in with that. And then there's a bit of here around coding, which I'll expand on um, shortly. Uh, but it's uh, making sure that once you've uh, defined someone as having CKD, they're then being coded and put onto the register so that they can then be managed, treatment um, given, and and, fo and crucially followed up. Um, so discussing their uh, metrics, their numbers with someone with um, uh, with with CKD is, is is incredibly important, so that you're telling them what their ACR means, what their GFR means, uh, perhaps looking at trends with them and so forth. And this is the sort of conversations that hopefully will be happening um, within within um, sort of primary care environments. Um, it's not all, all about prescribing. There is also a lot to do with um, weight management, smoking cessation and, and so forth. But that really sort of sets out the um, uh, CKD early identification sort of pathway. Um, moving now on to, on to coding. Um, as with CKD identification um, not happening, there are huge issues around, around the coding. So we know that, again, looking at data from the CKD audit, um, there are significant numbers of people who are um, not just undiagnosed, but also uncoded with, with CKD. CKD prevalence goes up with age and the number of uncoded um, also um, does the same. So you can see quite, quite large proportions of people who have uncoded CKD. Um, this graphic here is showing um, multiple long-term conditions. Um, and, and this was some research done at um, Guys and Tommy's charity um, a couple of years ago now. Um, and it's a really nice study looking at um, what's called an acquisition sequence. So what they did was look at people who had multiple long term conditions. Uh, that's very much a direction of travel at the moment in, in integrated care systems is to look at multiple long term conditions rather than single disease entities. Uh, and what you see here in, in blue is diabetes. So diabetes is is very well represented and it's um, it's it's thought of as a gateway condition to other long term conditions. So if you think of Long term conditions as a shopping basket analogy. Uh, diabetes is usually the first disease you pick up and first one you put in your shopping basket as you then progress through life and pick up other disease processes. But you can see in green how common um, kidney, chronic kidney disease is and how intrinsically linked it is to, to diabetes there. So CKD is a very common uh, long term condition. And this is on a background of um, uh, sort of, you know, uh, poor identification and poor coding and yet it's still showing up so so prominently here so i think that's um that hopefully highlights a little bit of the of the issues 
And once the coding happens, this is um, just showing some <clears throat> rag rating and, and things that can be done. Um, and I've just highlighted my practice here. Um, you, the idea is that you can build up a register of people with CKD um, and then you're able to track um, hypertension, appropriate treatments like uh, RAS blockade, statin prescribing um, and so forth. So um, all of this is only possible once you have, um, as, as with all uh, everything within primary care, accurate uh, coding, accurate disease registers and so forth. And it's not just about statins and hypertension uh, management. Um, SGLT2s is also um, sort of um, becoming much more prominent through all the guideline changes that have happened um, quite recently, uh, both for CKD and for um, type 2 diabetes management, which um, you'll hear a, a little bit more about from Dr. Shaw later. Sorry. Um, so we've put together a coding um, document, and um, these are just some of the kind of principles that I'm just picking out from it. Um, so what we've advocated in the coding document is that coding should include both the EGFR and urine ACR values relevant to that CKD detection. So what does that mean? That means that higher level coding, such as saying coding someone with chronic renal impairment or chronic kidney disease, we should kind of avoid that um, coding. Um, because that doesn't really tell you enough about that person. It doesn't tell you what stage they're at. It doesn't tell you uh, their progression. It doesn't tell you enough. It doesn't give you enough information that's quite relevant now related to prescribing, related to disease progression, related to how often we should be seeing and checking them, etc. So that high level coding should be avoided. Uh, and we should be using uh, coding relative to their GFR and ACR. So that's an important sort of take home message. Where you do have some uh, nomenclature like diabetic nephropathy uh, that exists and that's appropriate to a specific disease type, that's fine to use that kind of coding, but it should still include blood and urine values relevant to that diagnosis. So if you're going to use coding like diabetic nephropathy, that's completely fine, but don't forget that coding should still um, be in there related to someone's uh, GFR and ACR values. Sorry, apologies, just waiting for the slides to change. OK, so um, these are the um, coding um, coding possibilities. So what we've um, done here is defined two, two ways or two groups. Uh, these are sort of two different ways and systems of, of coding. Uh, so looking at, at the left here, you've got all those ACR categories, 0 to 3, 3 to 30 and greater than 30. Uh, group one um, just defines um, each each category as either A1, 2, 3, uh, and group two might be more common um, um, sort of coding that people might be more familiar with. So in probably in a lot of primary care environments, um, the sort of coding that you'd see would be related to either no codes or words like microbinuria. And, and what we're trying to do is, is move on from code group two to code group one. Um, if we look at people's GFRs, um, again here you've got different categories of, of GFRs uh, and again um, the coding that you might be more familiar with might be saying CKD stage 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, uh, but what we're, what we're advocating is, is coding group 1 which uses these G codes and A codes and, and I'll show you now how, how that kind of works. So it's probably easier to look at a, a patient example. So if we, if we take a patient um, and let's assume they've got type 2 diabetes and hypertension, They've had their routine bloods and urine, urine tests done and uh, their GFR has come back as 74 and the ACR has come back as 5.5, uh, just as, a, as an example. So looking at their GFR, uh, it's 74, so therefore they're in the 60 to 90 category. Um, you could code them as CKD stage 2, but what we're saying is to use that G2. So they're in the G2 category here because they're, they're, their GFR is uh, between 60 to 90. Their ACR is 5.5, so they're in that 3 to 30 category. So now we're going to say that they are A2, so they're in, in, in that sort of second second group there. Again, old coding would have said um, CKD stage 2 and microbiomenuria. Those are two separate codes, SNOMED codes that need to be put in. So if we're using coding group 1 for this patient, there's a single SNOMED code that could be put in that says CKD G2 A2, and that tells you straight away that uh, they are G2, in other words, their GFR is between 60 to 90. Their A2, in other words, their uh, their ACR is between 3 and 30. So it, it's it's a very precise way of coding. It's a single SNOMED code, 
Whereas using group two, you'd have to put in two different codes related to that, CKD2 and marker and error. And what often happens is that the ACR bit is often lost in the picture. So sometimes the, the, the GFR coding is put in, sometimes it's not, and sometimes the ACR isn't put in and sometimes it's not. So coding using group one, um, we think, does provide that granularity. It aligns very well with all the guidance that's out there, whether that's the KDIGO guidance, whether that's NICE guidance, um, and it provides this single code, which is which is much, much easier to, to put in. Um, it also aligns to frequency of testing, and you can see that on the on the, the graphic on the right. Uh, this is taken, lifted from the Kodago guidance, and it just um, shows for each uh, G category and A category how often uh, people should be sort of reviewed and, and, and checked on, a, on an annual basis. So it goes from either one to sort of more than four times. Um, we can also sort of track disease progression um, and um, and also sort of define treatments a bit more easily. Looking at that graphic, uh, what you'll see is that uh, what I've sort of done here is say, this is how KDIGO labels it, saying that people are in a sort of yellow or amber uh, categories. In other words, um, they should be checked once or twice a year. I think this is probably a bit more reflective of what happens within a primary care environment, that we treat this whole group as a sort of green. Um, and the group to particularly pay attention to are those who are in the G2 and A2 category. So that's if you track along from G2 to A2, that might be someone who, uh, like that patient we just had an example of, their GFR is 70, but they've got a slightly raised um, uh, microbiome of, say, five, six, seven, or whatever it is. Um, those people are sort of generally treated as green, um, but really they should be, uh, they, they are in a, in a risk category now. So they they they're in yellow, not not in a green category, but again by having the better coding, it's you're e easier to sort of see and track track those patients. Again, um, often what happens is that a lot of people in these other categories are then um, put into yellow rather than being in in sort of amber. And some of the people in the red categories we may also sort of subclassify. Um, and it's it's because that that um, ACR capture isn't happening and it's not being acted on, it's not being coded uh, properly. So this is what we're trying to sort of um, get across to people is the importance of of having um, the ACR values um, added in alongside um, GFR. And just to end with this, this is um, a slide taken from many moons ago, but um, I think it's it's still very relevant and pertinent today. Um, what it's showing here is um, a patient, a real life case study from someone who's GFR was dropping and you can see what a typical picture is that their GFR has dropped from 80 to 70 to 60 etc uh, and what you're noticing here is when healthcare systems and services kick in so that renal biopsy is happening at that sort of time point um, and then at the bottom there you can see the clinic visits per year so you can see how the healthcare system is so late um, um, into sort of kicking in uh, and by the end that person is having 16 20 plus visits a year that GFR drop was probably not being picked up because technically in people's eyes, it's sort of normal. It's 80, it's 70, it's 60. These are fine. What you're not seeing then is maybe the ACR. That ACR is probably creeping up alongside that GFR drop. It'd be, you know, uh, the two often go hand in hand. So by having that ACR there, hopefully we're able to pick up these people um, a lot uh, earlier and manage them more appropriately. I'll um, stop there then. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil. That's great. And I'm just going to hand over um, to um, Kat, who's going to be telling us uh, three actions within three months to save lives. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kieran, and thanks, Neil. And hello, everybody. So um, as it's already been said, my name is Kat Shaw. I'm a kidney consultant at King's College Hospital. And I'm just going to spend the next few moments talking a little bit more about the care pathways and medication pathways. <clears throat> that we've been thinking about in terms of chronic kidney disease and um, progression prevention. Uh, next slide, please. So I thought just for a moment, it's a good opportunity just to sit and reflect about what the backbone to CKD care has been. And it's, it's been the same for a long time, hasn't it? So we've for a long time known about the risk of diabetes and to the risk of hypertension in terms of progression of end stage kidney disease and also the cardiovascular risk. And for a long time, RAS blockade has been the backbone and evidence based backbone um, of our management strategies. And then 
there hasn't been anything else new that's been demonstrated from an evidence base to really potentially influence the outcomes that we're interested in in terms of cardiovascular risk and the risk of progression to end stage over that last 20 years or so. And next slide, please. But clearly that um, territory has now changed with the advent and the evidence base around about SGLT2 inhibitors in chronic kidney disease. Now, I know a lot of people on this call will be very familiar with these medications already, and certainly from a diabetes management perspective, but there are you know, two pivotal trials over the last few years to just think about, um, and we've already seen this slide just pop up in Neil's slide deck as well, thinking about the evidence base for SGLT2s in chronic kidney disease. And so first of all, we have credence and looking at the primary outcome here it was doubling of serum creatinine or progression to end stage kidney disease or death due to cardiovascular or kidney disease. And it was a, a large multinational um, randomized controlled trial looking at canagliflozin in patients with type 2 diabetes and albuminuric kidney disease. And it's absolutely, you know, when you take a look at the data, it's really quite astounding, isn't it? You see this relative risk reduction that's really significant, a hazard ratio of 0 0.7 for treatment. So that's a relative risk reduction of 30% for the primary outcome. And looking at the numbers needed to treat to avoid one primary outcome, only 21. And this is, you know, this is really quite phenomenal in terms of change in practice for us. Next slide, please. And then the natural question is, does that... Um, improvement in outcomes potentially only relate to those with type 2 diabetes and kidney disease. And so this is where DAPA CKD came in and they recruited people with diabetes and without diabetes um, who had proteinuric kidney disease. So this increased albumin leak into the urine. And here we can see again, just in the middle of the slide, you can see the primary outcome is that composite of kidney and cardiovascular outcomes again. And you can see this striking difference between the treatment group. This time it was dapagliflozin rather than canagliflozin in compared to those that, that weren't treated with the, with the active agent. And again, this is a relative risk reduction of about 30%. So it's really a, a stop moment for us all in terms of thinking about general chronic kidney disease care and an opportunity for us to think about how we can do things better. Next slide, please. And so in terms of thinking about the London Kidney Network, so as part of the preventing progression um, work, work stream, we've ha had a subgroup that's been focused thinking really about the clinical pathways around about these medications. And so our thought process was, can we use the advent of these SGLT2 inhibitors with this evidence base to help try and lever improvement across the entire CKD pathway? And you've already heard from Neil about looking to try and identify people in primary care who are at risk early in terms of thinking about about their GFRs and albuminuria testing. And the objectives for our subgroup, and this was a multidisciplinary team of um, <clears throat> kidney doctors and primary care and people with expertise in diabetes and pharmacy, so lots of different types of people. And our key objectives were to develop and implement a clinical pathway to support across the entire healthcare pathway, so primary and secondary care in the appropriate prescription of SGLT2 inhibitors, looking at these two populations. So those with type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease, and then the other second population, looking at those with CKD and albuminuria, but without type 2 diabetes. And the primary outcome that we're looking at to start off with is a process measure. It's looking at the increase in prescription of these medications in primary and secondary care. And you know, the process measure is a surrogate for quality of care because it means that we're identifying these people, we're testing them, we're getting them onto the evidence-based medications. And also then we want to make sure that we're lining up in the future to get the longer, more medium-term outcomes, which we obviously we're really interested in, which is a reduction in cardiovascular events and reduction in instant rates of end-stage kidney disease. And from, you know, from the trial data, you're looking at about three to five years and beyond to try and measure those impacts. Thanks. Next slide, please. And so when we were sitting as a group and there were many machinations and lots of time thinking and throwing ideas around, one of the um, pieces that was a consensus really from the outset was we thought that the messaging did need to try and focus on um, giving across that there is a time critical component to these actions. Um, I think that 
we could probably all imagine or reflect on practice that we've been involved in or seen where perhaps NACE inhibitors started and then six months later we up titrate the dose a little bit. And really what we are saying is that it's it, it needs to be quicker than that. We need to be more proactive than that. And we need to help support and design systems in our clinical care pathways that en enable us to get patients rapidly onto the medications that we know are going to try and help protect their health. And then and, and so with within that came along the lines of the three key actions within three months. And we started to think about the triggers. And so Neil has already elucidated to these in terms of albuminuria, clearly type 2 diabetes is a trigger, and also heart failure. For the purpose of today, I won't talk any more about heart failure. We're going to just focus on the purely kidney specific triggers. Next slide, please. And so then we have three within three. We have three key actions within three months to help save people's lives. And if we start with the first patient population, so those with type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease, and you can see that there are three actions across three months. Action one, either initiate or ma and or maximise the intensity of the RAS blockade. And so we're looking to start an ACE inhibitor or ARB and then to try titrate within that first month to the maximum tolerated licensed dose. Also, just within there, we've put in that we would um, advise reviewing whether an individual is on a statin and from a cardiovascular risk perspective starting one if they're not on one already unless obviously contraindicated. Then we have action two within month two and we have initiate the SGLT2 inhibitor according to the license. As with all of our new medications clearly that will be with patient engagement and talking through potential um, advantages and any potential side effects um, and making sure that patients are aware of the sick day rules. And I think we're all very used to communicating those, especially around other medications such as ACE inhibitors already. Then we have action three within month three. And then this is the further focus on getting the blood pressure down to target if we've not achieved that with the medication um, that the individual is already on and trying to optimise as per NICE guidance. Next slide, please. And we have a, a further pictogram, which, which should come up hopefully, uh, which just gives a little bit more detail if that's what's needed as well. I'm so sorry that slide's not moved on. I don't know if it has for others. Ah, perfect. Thank you so much. Sorry, a little bit of delay. So as you can see, there's a slightly more detailed pictogram across the three um, themes, so the month one, month two and month three thematics. And it has also the relevant links to the NICE guidance and other guidance, including the UK Kidney Association guidelines around SGLT2s for people to look at if they need it. Next slide, please. And then we have again three within three three key actions within three months to save lives. And this is in the second cohort of um, our population, those without type 2 diabetes, but do have kidney disease with albuminuria. And you'll see here that there's a minor difference in terms of the, the urine ACR um, starting points so 22.6 milligrams per millimole. But the terms of the actions, they're exactly the same. It's action one, RAS blockade and a statin. It's action two in month two, looking at the SGLT2 inhibitor within its license. And it's action three, month three, in terms of further optimization of blood pressure targets. Next slide, please. And following on will be again just a slightly expanded pictogram. And again, it's it, it's very similar to those with type 2 diabetes. What I should say is there's a certain subgroups of patients that are currently excluded from the evidence base, and that's those with autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease or who are on immune therapy directly for their renal disease or renal transplant patients. But clearly those patients as well will be sitting in secondary care, the vast majority of them. So um, we're always here to help advise for any of the patient populations. Next slide, please. And so we spent a lot of time thinking hard about the messaging and thinking about the package, which obviously is really important. But what we're all interested in is actually getting these medications to people. It's affecting the change. It's demonstrating that we are supporting the patients who are at risk of chronic kidney disease and making sure that they're treated um, in a timely and optimised fashion. And so the London Kidney Network is working across all of the areas in our, in our, in our region. And it's really interesting actually learning about how different at the different stages people are at across the different ICSs already in terms of their CKD pathways, in terms of their infrastructures, in terms of their informatics. And 
And so there's always that um, balance, isn't there, in terms of what can be done at a big level, at a, a kind of broad regional level, and then also enabling local nuance and local innovation. And so the LKN is interdigitated across all of the different ICSs and helping embed the LKN pathways and helping um, the, the, the various um, teams work together in terms of uh, delivering the, the optimization pathways and therapies. So uh, we can talk more about that and the, the detail if people are interested, obviously, in the in the chat afterwards. But for now, I'll stop um, and I will hand on over to Joe. Thanks, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Perfect. Thanks, Joe. Excellent. I'll just test if I can move the slides on. So my name is Joanne. I'm a kidney nurse specialist. I work at Imperial and I support chronic kidney disease educational programs in Northwest London. Why is it important um, to communicate how we communicate chronic kidney disease to our patients? And I just wanted to bring you some quotes here because the patients are at the start of what we are doing. So what does chronic kidney disease actually mean? I don't think I have it. I have kidney problems for some time, but it's all stable. I never had a chance to talk about it, and I don't know where to find reliable information. I've been searching on YouTube. I was never told I have chronic kidney disease until you contacted me. My GP told me that my blood test is fine. My urine is fine. I only have protein in the urine. I wish everyone used the same language. CKD sounds much less important than chronic kidney disease. The first time I was told I had CKD was when I was referred to the hospital to plan dialysis. And this shows us a clear need to communicate with clarity a chronic kidney disease diagnosis at the early stage of the disease. So how do we explain CKD diagnosis? And since we're doing this three within three, I'm trying to do this also in three steps. And the first and most important uh, step I would suggest is to be clear with the diagnosis. And we should use the right words and say you have chronic kidney disease and avoid perhaps saying, oh, the kidneys are not working so well. That's also important, but we need to label it and make the statement clear. Of course, this is then going to to take us to what does that mean and it means the kidneys are not working as well as they should and or it means the kidneys are damaged and leaking protein in the urine so what to expect often when i have these conversations with patients they said oh nurse uh, i don't think i do it because i feel fine and i think it's important to explain that this is a silent disease which means no symptoms are expected in the early stages in most cases does not represent an immediate threat but it comes with an increased risk of cardiovascular and renal events. In other words, the risk of having heart attacks, strokes, and needing dialysis or transplant in the future. But luckily, only a small number of patients reach this level. It's then important to explain that CKD can progress, in other words, get worse over months and years, but good monitoring and management is key to reduce the speed of the progression and sometimes prevent progression. And this is really important because if we explain the purpose to the patients, then we have engagement. So how do we then explain uh, test results on ongoing um, reviews after they've been diagnosed? And again, I'll, I'll just flag here three steps. One is to let's focus on EGFR and perhaps avoid using ureas and creatinines because one trend up, the other one's trend down. So I think it's con consistently we should use EGFR and refer to it as a kidney number or kidney percentage. Then we, we explain that UACR shows us protein leak and healthy kidneys don't leak protein in the urine because I don't think this message is going across quite well. And probably the most important um, step then is, is it getting worse over the years? And this is a graph that I use when I do patient education sessions with patients and say, you know, the actual number isolated tells us very little. And what's much more useful is for you to try and understand, you know, in the last five years, has your function been the same or has it gone worse? And if we look at the graph, for example, if we look at Mr. Orange, five years down the line, his function has barely declined. So is is stable and stable means 
that he still has chronic kidney disease, but it's not getting worse. Stable doesn't mean he doesn't have the disease. And this is something that uh, sometimes is a message confused. Whilst Mrs. Blue is in a bit more trouble. So, and Mrs. Blue probably represents uh, a lot of patients that we see in clinic. So the next question takes us to what can we do to alter this graph line? And before I go into that, I just wanted to bring this case study. That's a patient that I saw in clinic for some reflection. So I, this is a 77-year-old man, chronic kidney disease, ischemic heart disease with previous MI, hypertension, diabetic. I printed his GFR. And usually what I do is I print it and then I start drawing lines with the patient. So first line that I drew was this blue line and say, you know, this is getting worse for a couple of years. But then we've noticed that something changed. And I was having a discussion with the patient and tried to understand what happened then. And we had a look at the notes and realized this is when the ACE and SGLT2 were started and optimized. And I think, you know, just to bring this again to the discussion and to reflect, I think with this whole campaign is, can we try to achieve this kind of um, results with early intervention in much earlier stages. So we we drawing these graphs with the patients and say, you know, the line is going down, what can we do? And we need to also be clear on how we communicate treatments because sometimes patients say, you know, I, I don't take any treatment for CKD. So I just think we need to be clear that ACE and ARBs and SGLT2s are actually CKD treatments that protect the kidneys and the heart. Advise against NSAIDs and discuss sick day rules. When I explained to patients at the very beginning, we explained that CKD means there is an increased cardiovascular risk. And so I always tell the patients that we're not just avoiding dialysis, we need to make sure that we prevent heart attacks because that's a killer. And we need to do everything we can to, to reduce this risk that everyone in the population has, but because you have kidney disease, this is increased in you. So it's important to, to discuss lifestyle changes. And that's not surprising for you. This applies to pretty much all the population. However, what I do say for our patients is, even if they uh, don't have high blood pressure, I recommend everyone to buy a blood pressure machine and get into the routine of checking it. And then provide them supporting info. I don't know if you're familiarized with this poster, Understanding Chronic Kidney Disease. So these are this links patients to three videos patient educational videos that we've developed professional and imperial and we've made this poster intentionally un unbranded so it can be shared across units and hopefully it supports primary care to um, discuss, have these discussions with patients. I just wanted to give you a brief overview about our Northwest London CKD patient program because I think there is value in sharing practices and sometimes there is a transferable uh, skills. So Know Your Kidneys is our patient education session. It targets patients with CKD stage 1 to 3 or early stage 4 and aims to have a discussion explaining CKD diagnosis, treatments, lifestyle and self-care. It has uh, over the years had lots of changes. It started initially as face-to-face, -face, only accessible to patients under secondary care. In 2021, moved to virtual as a result of COVID, but it actually enabled us to expand referral to covering all Northwest London areas rather than capturing a limited area uh, around the venue. And the other change that we've done is that we expanded referral extending to patients under integrated care. So patients that are under primary care, but they would come to our virtual clinic. So the actual referral would come from our secondary care clinicians. And in 2023, it stays uh, virtual. We've developed a supporting CKD patient education page on the ICS website with information available in different formats to reduce health inequalities. And we've extended the referral directly from primary care clinicians. This was just tested and is about to be disseminated across all Northwest London. And this takes me to my last slide. So what are we doing uh, to tackle accessibility barriers? So I think our biggest challenge in the programme is to was to develop a referral pathway that was easy and uh, admin and time less time consuming. And Getting to the point where we have an easy referral standard text facilitates access to a greater number of patients and removes geographical barriers. And coming soon is we're inc incorporating this text to IMIS and System 1 clinical templates, enabling us to develop an ICS web page that 
is designed to support patient information, we um, enabled us to have all the information in one page. And this means that the patients can um, self-register to the sessions, but if they're not IT um, literate to actually attend a virtual session, they can download uh, booklets. We also have multiple dates available. We have sign language interpreter available as per request, and we've reformatted the format and the time of the session from two hours to one hour based on patient feedback. We also have um, reference to um, the Kidney Care UK website accessibility tool and reference to the National Kidney Federation helpline. And coming soon, we're currently translating the videos, um, adding subtitles and dubbing. Thank you for listening, and I just want to uh, um, thank all, all of our patient representatives for their time and for ongoing feedback, helping us to improve the service. Be happy to take any questions. Great. So I think that's fantastic. We'll have, we'll have lots of hopefully lots of times for questions. We're going to move on to the <clears throat> moderated uh, Q and A session uh, with. Um, Pauline, um, to grill us. <laughs> We've had some lovely questions um, and thank you to our uh, audience. I wish we could see all your faces because that's uh, what we would like. But anyway, we've got some really interesting questions. And so I will start by, look, there's a really, there's a really good question here. What's the difference between ACR and PCR? Um, I don't mind who wants to take that, but um, yeah, something that, that probably even nephrologists get kind of a little bit confused about. What should we be testing? Kieran. Yes, OK, shall I chip in? So, so basically, they're kind of essentially the same thing. So ACR is an albumin creatinine ratio and PCR is protein creatinine ratio. And in our patients, most of the protein in the protein creatinine ratio is albumin, probably about 70% of it. So on the back of an envelope calculation, you could kind of think of a PCR you know, of 50 is the equivalent of an ACR of 30 to 40. Now, it's not the same for every patient, but that's the kind of, um, uh, you know, ballpark figure that we that we think of. So a PCR of 100 is the equivalent of an ACR of 70. It, it's not quite that, but that's kind of, and um, ACRs are more accurate at earlier um, levels of, C, of proteinuria. And so we should be doing ACR testing. ACR testing is a bit more expensive than PCR testing. And particularly for people with diabetes, we should be doing ACR testing because it's a much better validated and can really detect the earlier uh, levels of albuminuria that PCRs can't detect. So on the whole, I would like to have people doing ACR testing. ACRs definitely before PCRs. Only when you get up to the really high levels of proteinuria do we convert to the PCRs. And Neil, there's a question here. If I can ask you, um, do, sh there's a quite a few questions around this about when to retest. So if your ACRs as, as at the lower level, um, do do you advise waiting for a period of time before um, doing the early morning uh, confirmatory ACR? And what if they have an intercurrent urine infection that's causing the albuminuria? If you can just tackle both of those. Sure. So so as with as with a lot of kind of um, Things within primary care when you're diagnosing, there's often uh, a need for sort of repetition to confirm. Um, so nice kind of advocates repeating the ACR within within three months. It doesn't sort of define a, a date by which it's done, uh, but that gives you a ballpark figure. And the reason is, um, as you said, there may be some other reason for a raised ACR. There's often also a lot of variability with an ACR. So where you've got ACR values that are maybe four or five, um it it's um you know that, that can be repeated and come back as as normal there may be a, an intercurrent illness a uti that needs treating etc so it's the same analogy for you know if you if you're diagnosing diabetes and the hb1c comes back as you know on, on the borderline you and they're asymptomatic you would repeat it so it's the, the same the same sort of principles there so within three months That's ideally Perfect. Within three months, that's that's really clear. Thank you. Um, I've I've got a sort of case history shared here by one of our audience. He's a mid fifties South Asian, well controlled. Uh, uh, 
blood pressure as well, controlled on an ARB, in different glycemic control. He's type 2 diabetes and he's on statin antiplatelet candesartan, already on an SGLT2 with a sort of fairly well preserved EGFR at 88, but his ACR remains high at around 50. What should he be doing or what should his GP be telling him to do, Cat? <laughs> It's all looking well. You've done it. You've 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 done all the great steps already. It just makes sure that a a so ARB is maximised, and obviously you already got him on the SGLT two inhibitor. Um, I think you know, obviously ongoing monitoring is really important, and all the other simple things around about avoiding potential nephrotoxins. And I think just vitally, you might have said it in the case history. I might have missed it. Sorry. Making sure that the blood pressure is is down to target because I think that can be quite difficult to achieve, can't it? Um, but it it it. It sounds like he, he's maximised at the moment and as long as we're happy there's nothing else going on and there's no haematuria as well, then I, I think you have to sit tight and continue to monitor. I don't know if anybody would do anything else. I'm just wondering, um, not not for really conversation, there, there are some newer agents coming yeah. out, they're not yet really or, uh, as yet, but we'll be updating guidelines uh, uh, soon, soon with some of the um, Aldosterone receptor antagonist phenerinone um, is a potential add-on if people's if people's um, have a CKD diabetes and uh, uh, ongoing albuminuria. So, on to the next question: um, Do we tell our patients their end-stage kidney failure risk? Answer from anyone who does discuss this with their patients, please. So, so I, I do, I do discuss it with some of my patients, particularly to reassure them. Often coming to see a kidney doctor is very, very scary, and they worry, gosh, they're going to be on dialysis next week, and and you know this is the end of things. And actually, I say, look, you, you know, particularly, and it's particularly with more elderly people with slightly more advanced CKD that they think that they're going to be on dialysis. And actually, say, look, you know, in five years' time, the chances of you having end stage renal failure is five percent, eight percent, and people find that very reassuring. And so I, I often use the kidney failure risk equation in those in those circumstances to, to really reassure patients and really say, look, this is about trying to keep you healthy generally, trying to keep your heart healthy, trying to keep you well, rather than necessarily saying we're going to have to you know, give you dialysis. Cats nodding in violent yeah. agreement with you. I was just going to say, I think it's such a nice tool as well. It's it, such a it good is. visual aid. It's really well designed. And so you um, people can use it for themselves as well. And I think, again, it just highlights right at the centre that the UACR is pivotal in terms of thinking about that that risk and so it just again incorporates that into the language both for the clinician and for the for the person involved. Brilliant thank you and a, a question for Linda if she doesn't mind coming on to the screen and um, someone's saying they're taken aback by these really important prognostic challenges because of coding and cleaning the house it's a huge task for our GPs to try and uh, uh, try and find all these patients clean up the database is there any tools or anything that that we've got to help GPs Linda? Most definitely. Thank you, Pauline. So as part of our Pan London prevention work within the LKN, um, what we are working on is producing a resource package that we'll be sharing across um, London and beyond um, if, if anyone would like to access this. So what it will contain is it will contain um, uh, tools that will support uh, primary care and patients in terms of um, early identification and optimization of management of CKD. So that could be things such as searches, templates, signposting uh, to patient leaflets um, and so on. So yes. That's Thanks. Lovely. Thanks very much. Um, Oh, yes, this is an important one as well. And back to Kat. <laughs> um, so it's the it's the three month issue, Kat. And, and you may have been asked this before, but, um, you know, when incrementing the dose of the ACE inhibitors, should we be sort of checking kidney function and then increasing? How can we how can we do all of that within a month um, or three months? Thanks. Thanks so much. No, yes, it is a question that comes up quite a lot. And I think the first thing to say is, you know, this is not hard and fast. These are our suggestions, our guidance that I think we, we're trying to 
promote this buy-in that we do need to do something under a time kind of constraint really to try and get the maximum benefit to the maximum amount of people at the early stages as well you know picking them up really early I think so as per kind of nice guidance and starting your a sorry at your ARB we would usually recommend rechecking your blood test a couple of weeks after that knowing that there will be a change in the creatinine and you know that we are accepting of your know, a 20% change and we expect that because of the hemodynamic effects of the ACE and the ARB so not to get too worried by that but we are checking and we're going to look at that potassium as well I think you know what we are also trying to promote and again this is a a bit of a, a kind of a, a a step shift for a lot of a lot of people is not necessarily starting at these doses of 1.25 milligrams of ramapil but you know thinking it's okay we can start at five milligrams this patient is hypertensive they've got proteinuria and actually the evidence base for the cardiovascular and renal benefits sit at the higher doses of the ACE and the ARB so I think you know we need to 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 try and support each other in order to get good dosing and um, in terms of the clinical pathways, so I think you know that is just something that we all have to have a discussion in our own localities, isn't it? How do we design the system to support somebody being identified, getting the medication, getting their blood test, having their blood test reviewed, and then their medication optimised? I think there's a real role for the MDT. There's not hard and set about who needs to do that. We can think about all of our allied health professionals and prescribing teams that are able to work in that pathways. And you know, I know there's a lot of really exciting innovations going on across across the different regions and networks. Works. So I, I don't know if that quite answers the question, but um, but yes, let, let's let's crack on and get those medications prescribed. Exactly, lovely. Thank you. Um, I've got a question myself, if you don't mind, for Joanna. Joanna, um, I saw on your thing, know your know your kidneys. Is that kind of so that patients will know their numbers for blood pressure, know their kidneys, know their? Is that sort of a, a was that meant to be sort of linked in with know your numbers for blood pressure? Um, it's a thanks for the question. So the name of the of the program was already decided before I joined. I joined in, so I had I just kept the same name, but uh, it's it's a lot about how we promote patient um, engagement and empower them to know about their life, about their health, about their kidneys, but not just about their kidneys. So it's understanding what chronic kidney disease is, but also, you know, understanding their blood pressure results, understanding their uh, EGFR results, understanding their trends, understanding how to look after themselves. And sometimes it's just, you know, I, I often say, you know, just have a booklet where you write all the hospital appointments you attend, have a section for all your blood pressure, for your medicines, because what is quite frustrating for patients is attending from hospital to GP to different um, care providers and then people don't communicate and then I, I tell them you need to own your own health and and take ownership for your for your results and for your care. That's it. I think that is very, very important indeed. And somebody's put in the chat, it's a, I think it's a doctor or Martinez Martinez. Um, so their integrated CKD programme in Leicester is very similar with similar patient information and things. So I think we'll look, look at that. Thank you for posting that. Now, a couple of people have also requested the slide deck because there's a lot of information in that slide deck, particularly about ACR testing, um, getting the, the CKD coding correct and then of course cat, cats three and three and then all the patient information so this slide deck will be made available to you and I, I i don't know how we're going to distribute that but we will make a great effort to do that and i want to thank you all for your questions thank you for coming uh to this oh, well, i'll hand it back to to Kieran to say all of that but but thank you very much for all of your questions everybody they've been been really interesting Thanks, Paul. And you were you were doing far better a job than I was anyway. So, um, but yeah. So just just to just to run things off, I, you know, as other people said, look, I'm so grateful to all our speakers today for doing such an amazing talk and really, you know, saying exactly what needs to be said for for people with chronic kidney disease. Thanks to uh, the uh, the people who attended. Thanks to the patients who attended. Thanks to the staff who asked such such amazing questions. Because I think you know if. The questions that you're asking are the questions that we're asked all the time. And, and you know, I think that getting the message out there, answering the questions that you need is is so great. Thanks to the LKN team and Sinead for helping to put all this together. And thanks to everybody. Um, I hope you found it useful. 
Um, we will hopefully be doing more things in the future and, and look out for World Kidney Day 2024 next year. Uh, oh, and Linda had one more thing to say, I think. You know, I just wanted to reassure people that we will be this um, video recording will be um, uploaded onto uh, YouTube of which uh, Sinead's organising. And yes, we will send out the slide deck. And just just to say um, we are supporting implementation of these pathways across the ICSs. So it might might not have filtered um, down, right down yet to to uh, the people on the front line. But um, do get in contact with the LKN if um, you would like to know more about that. And I might interject Thanks. also and just say, because I can see that there are a huge number of questions on the chat that Pauline was deftly getting through as many as she could. But what might be beneficial is maybe as a panel, we're more than happy to make sure that we get answers to, to people on those questions. Because there's some really relevant questions around prescribing of SGLT2s, whether that can be initiated in primary care. Um, and we will make sure that we make the answers to those questions available. So um, we have everyone's everyone's details and thanks so much. Back to you, Kieran. Was there anything else to say? Nothing but goodbye, I guess. Thank you, Thank very you much. everyone. Goodbye. Godspeed. Thanks all. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye bye. Bye.